All right, we are live. Um, I'm, as always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, founder of the Jew3 Project, and you're tuned into another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. Uh, we have a very special guest today, backed by popular demand, Dr. Vince Bontu. Welcome, Dr. Bontu. Hey, hey, Lisa, good to see you again. <laughs> I know. Uh, we had you on the podcast a few months ago, and you talked about is Christianity the white man's religion? And it's people have loved it. They love the articles you wrote. So we wanted to do a video version, um, just so people who didn't get to hear the audio version uh, would get the video version, and then we can dig a little bit deeper into things that we didn't talk about and talk about the articles that you've written. So for those who haven't um, read your articles or heard your past podcast with us, um, can you give our our audience a little bit of background about yourself? Yeah, most definitely. Um, well, uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, here in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm a native here. It's my hometown. And, uh, I, I kind of have two, uh, two hats. Um, and I'm a pastor and a professor. So really the Lord has called me from an early age to, uh, kind of be in two different places, both, uh, in ministry and also in the academy. And so I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm the teaching pastor at Jubilee Community Church in North St. Louis. Missouri. I'm uh, one of the one of three pastors there. It's and it's an urban, uh, multicultural church seeking to uh, bring the full gospel, uh, the, uh, minister the whole gospel in North St. Louis, which is um, uh, you know the community I'm from. It's a community with its challenges, but a uh, but a blessed community with uh, many uh, many of God's people and God's presence doing awesome things there. And so um, so yeah, I, I had the privilege and honor of doing that of serving the church. Uh, and then also on the academic side, uh, I'm a professor of missiology at Covenant Theological Seminary. Uh, it's a seminary. It's the it's the denominational seminary of the Presbyterian Church of America, and uh, and um, and so uh, and my my church is affiliated with the Evangelical Free Denomination. So I'm kind of in different uh, different places in several different ways. Um, but yeah, it's a privilege and honor to be there. This is my first year there teaching full time. Uh, teaching classes on missions and, and cross-cultural ministry, uh, contextualization, global Christianity, um, and uh, and uh, also some of these things that we've talked about, uh, you know, just kind of uh, early African and early Asian Christianity and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, church history and things like that. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the, the two main things that I do. Um, and then also um, excited to be spending some time working on my first book project right now. Uh, we're with Intervarsity Press and uh, it's uh, going to be kind of a, a survey and introduction to um, the early Christianity in Africa and Asia and the Middle East for uh, believers and for seminary students, college students and uh, leaders, pastors that, you know, maybe uh, haven't had the opportunity to really uh, get into some of the more niche or highly specialized literature in this field. And so hopefully it can be a, a resource for people to uh, get the basics and get an introduction into uh, the fullness of church history that often unfortunately gets uh, and pushed out of our, our curriculum and our uh, the way that we tell the story. And so that's kind of the idea behind that. So yeah, that's just kind of a, Can you, can you still hear me or? Yeah, it broke up a little bit, but I can I can hear you now. Oh, okay. My end. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a little choppy, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Did did um, yeah, did you did you have another question or? Yes. Um. So okay. you did the blogs for us for uh, Nubia, Egypt, mm -hmm. and Ethiopia. For those who weren't able to read those, can you kind of give a just a a synopsis of and highlight uh, Christianity's rich history in those three places? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, uh, yeah, so um, we, you know, we did this, uh, this blog series and, um, and it was really fortunate, um, you know, because it was able to uh, really kind of distill some of the things that I'm working on in the book right now. And it was really, uh, um, it was really providential and helpful that it coincided with actually that, uh, this is that's the chapter I'm working on right now on early African Christian. You know, uh, I, I was working on uh, uh, trying to understand the historical progression of 
how Christianity became perceived as a white Western religion. Uh, and then I'm getting ready to move into how the gospel grew in Asia in the early uh, in the early period, which is another thing I have a lot of interest in as well. Um, but but, you know, over these last few months when we were doing this blog series, that's when I've been working on this chapter in Africa. So it was kind of like nice was able to, um, uh, you know, kind of do this in multiple contexts. Um, <laughs> and so and uh, and so, yeah, actually and actually um, in the book, I'm actually uh, including and working on right now. Um, like literally right now, right before we got on the phone, um, I'm working on uh, adding in a section about North Africa and Carthage as well, which mm. is, is another early African context that is uh, interesting. It's, it's actually Africa. Uh, one of the one of the interesting things about uh, you know we have this kind of modern concept of the continent of Africa, um, but of course in the you know in the in the ancient period. Uh, people that we would now call Africans and who even call themselves Africans, uh, especially these communities that we're looking at, Nubia, Ethiopia, and Egypt, really that Nile, kind of that Nile River connection of uh, different African communities would not have considered themselves African. Uh, they might not have even known what an African was. Uh, but in that period, and you know, Africa was a Roman province that was in along the coast of North Africa, modern day Tunisia and Algeria and Libya. Um, and uh, and and so um, and uh, and both both you know Africa in the Roman uh, sense and Egypt were both part of the Roman Empire uh, during that time. But Egypt would have been part of the Byzantine Empire, uh, where which is why Greek would have been the kind of the international language, uh, you know, in in Egypt, especially in Alexandria. Whereas in in Carthage, it would have been Latin speaking, and that's kind of following the two major divisions of the Roman Empire, West and East, for, you know, Latin and Greek speaking. Whereas Nubia and Ethiopia would have been independent kingdoms, completely uh, autonomous from the Roman Empire uh, that's, that spoke their own languages. But also in Nubia, Greek was pretty operative as well. But I say all that to say that um, I, I, I want to look at North Africa as well because of the interesting way that, uh, that North African Christians were also a part of um, the early development of Christianity and played a really integral role. Uh, a very integral role. You have figures like Tertullian and Augustine who really shaped a lot of Western Christianity and um, a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, you've mentioned the work of Thomas Odin and, uh, and, and others who have pointed out that really a lot of, a lot of Western Christian theology is rooted in these African fathers like Augustine and Tertullian. And so, we, you know, I want to look at them a little bit too, but the reason that I'm particularly interested in these Nile Valley civilizations which were predominantly christian uh is because that in these contexts that's when we start to see christian theology not only being developed by african believers um but also in indigenously african languages um and so uh you know obviously in in egypt we you know the first the earliest evidence for christianity is in greek but it's not very long um that after that that Christian uh, theology, and also even before that, actually, uh, you know, biblical literature and biblical material starts to appear in Coptic in the original African language. Mm. Um, and so uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's not to say that if somebody is uh, a Greek or a Latin speaker that they're less African. I mean, Augustine and, and Tertullian were, um, you know, they were Berbers, they were uh, Numidians. Um, and so they, uh, it's likely that they even spoke the Numidian language. It's just unfortunate that all of the literature that survives from Tertullian and Augustine and, uh, you know, uh, were written in Latin. Um, and, and so that there weren't, that, that uh, Christians weren't able to, you know, uh, develop literature in the Numidian or Berber languages. But we do know that uh, be based on testimony in Latin and Greek that Christianity was thriving in those communities. And, um, and, you know, it's, uh, but um, it's, you know, partly because of the, the Donatist controversy, which was a, um, you know, a, 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 a segment of Christianity that was considered to be heretical at the time, which, uh, t I mean, as a 21st century Protestant, it's, it's kind of hard for me to understand how this particular group from, uh, from a Christian standpoint today would it be considered heretical. Uh, I mean, but, you know, in, um, you know, in uh, a lot of the um, both, interestingly, despite the fact that Egypt and, and North Africa were uh, very linguistically and culturally distinct and, and very um, 
very different in so many ways. Uh, and, and to the point where it's hard to conceive of them as all being, um, you know, African in any kind of lump sum. Uh, but at the same time, that's still the case today as well, right? I mean, Africa is like, you know, hundreds of cultures and languages and, and, and traditions and complexions and hues. And yet, and yet we have this concept of Africa and even Africans themselves will, will call, use this term African. And so it's interesting, despite the cultural differences, that there's a similarity there. Because I mentioned the Donatists, but in early Christianity, we know that, especially in the Rome, for Christians living in the Roman Empire, that Christians were persecuted before Constantine. And mm -hmm. interestingly, both in Egypt and in North Africa, this theme of persecution was a similarity, was a commonality in both contexts. And both of them had uh, kind of extremist groups that were responding and reacting against not only the Roman Empire, which was pagan and which was persecuting Christians, but also responding in an extreme way against Christians who were, uh, for fear of being killed or persecuted because of their faith, were um, were converting back into Roman paganism and or were running away or trying to flee persecution. And so there, that was a big uh, issue in the early church: is how do Christians deal with? Uh, you know, do we do we run away or you know? And then when you do run away, but if you come back you know, can you be received back into fellowship? And that was a really big topic in the early church. And, you know, those of us in the United States today, we might not be able to, um, you know, it's, 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 you know, something that we probably would not be able to necessarily uh, rel uh, relate to. Um, but, uh, but many believers around the world today are still dealing with similar kind of persecution. And so it's just, it's just interesting to see the way the theological questions kind of change and priorities change based on time and place. But, um, but, but also it's interesting that, this issue of persecution and how Christians are to respond to persecution was uniquely um, was uniquely acute in both North Africa and Egypt, and both of those groups had um, again these these um, I don't want to say schismatic, but that these kind of divergent streams of Christianity. That in Egypt it became known as Miletianism, uh, that was uh, associated with a particular bishop named Melitus, who again had a very strict and conservative view on um, on what they call the being lapsed uh, as you know, kind of denying the faith. And the, the question of, well, if someone was lapsed and they re rejected Christ for fear of persecution, do we let them come back into faith or do they need to uh, kind of do some penance or are they just kind of done forever? Um, and so that was kind of the, you know, the you know, more strict perspective, whereas the dominant view was a little bit more, um, a little bit more lax uh, in terms of receiving Christians back into the faith. And in North Africa, you had uh, the Donatists, and uh, in, this, in a similar way, uh, you know, the Donatists had a more strict view of receiving uh, Christians back after they had rejected, uh, uh, had kind of um, lapsed based on persecution. And so, but, the, but with, uh, in North Africa, a large percentage of the Christian community were Donatists. And uh, in, you know, the, this, the work of William Friend uh, has, you know, been really um, kind of, uh, he has a whole uh, book on the the Donatist controversy in North African Christianity. And it seems that from the evidence that actually the Donatists had a really strong following, especially among the indigenous uh, Berber and Numidian speaking African Christians. And so it's highly likely that part of the reason that Christianity, uh, I mean, after the Islamic conquest, Christianity became extinct in uh, North Africa as well as in Nubia. Um, but again, so we, we only have this like, you know, five century window between the second and sixth centuries or seventh century, excuse me, where uh, we have Christianity in, in North Africa and people like Tertullian and Augustine. But again, in that window of, of time, all the evidence that remains is from Latin speaking Christians. And it's highly likely that uh, part of the reason for that was because the dominant, uh, the dominant version of Christianity that was popular among the indigenous Africans was this particular stream of Donatism, which was rejected by the mainstream church. And, you know, uh, again, I can't say what I would say if I was in that situation, but again, it's just, uh, to me, kind of, um, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't say that this is like a point of theological orthodoxy or heterodoxy, you know, in terms of, uh, denying the divinity of Christ or things like that. And so, um, but again, this kind of went against the dominant power structure at the time in the kind of the mainstream Catholic church that was centered, in, that was becoming more and more centered in Rome. And so, um, you know, say all that to say that this is similar to, uh, which I mentioned in the, um, mentioned in the blogs, this similar to a later development that happens that separated the 
Egyptian and Ethiopian and Nubian churches from the dominant church, which was the Council of Chalcedon, where Christology was articulated in a different way that I wouldn't go as far as to say it's heretical, but that's the way it was uh, kind of conceived. And that was really kind of the breaking point that separated um, uh, not only the African churches, but also the, uh, the, the majority of the Middle Eastern and Asian churches away from the dominant uh, Roman, you know, Western uh, Christological view. Um, and so, uh, and so all, but all that to say that, uh, you know, North Africa is interesting and it's, and we should include it. But for me, um, I think because of our, our Western preference that when we look at church history, we often look at it through the lens of people who wrote in Greek and Latin. And, um, and, and I mean, we were talking even before we got on that it's even difficult to find a lot of literature that's been translated into English that we can read that was written in Coptic or in Nubian or in uh, Ethiopic or Giz, the Giz language. And so, um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons why in the articles we really focused in on Egypt and Nubia and Ethiopia because of the way in which they've been so um, kind of ignored historically. I mean, most, most Christians, uh, especially if they've been to seminary or been to a, a Christian college or have done some, a significant degree of, of study have heard of Tertullian or Augustine. Um, most of them have. Now, a lot of times we don't know that they're African. And a lot of times their African identity is is intentionally manipulated. Um, and uh, we forget that these were, uh, again, that these were Numidian African brothers who just happened to write in Latin, but they were bilingual. Um, but, uh, but, we, uh, but we definitely, well, we still have heard their names. Whereas most believers have not heard the name or don't know who Shenouda of the Treep is, or they don't know who Narsai is, or they don't know um, who George of Gossetia is. And so these are, I guess the goal is that um, in emphasizing, again, the Nile Valley African Christian civilizations is so that it, among believers, especially as uh, believers of African descent, that that these names would become as as much of a household name as a as a John Chrysostom or an Augustine or a John Calvin or uh, all the other kind of famous people of church history. Can you give uh, our audience just a little bit about some of the names you mentioned, uh, just a brief uh, bio and why they're important, kind of highlight what they brought, to, uh, how they kind of influence Christian thought? Yeah, no, most definitely. I mean, uh, again, um, I think that, um, it, it, there's there's almost like a combination of the names and the figures themselves and also the communities that they came out of and even just knowing uh you know about 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 these communities in all different kind of ways and so i mean in uh you know we mentioned some of them and i mean in the in the blogs we just tried to highlight uh some of the kind of the the top you know examples of both through architecture and through theology and through um, uh, biblical translation, the way that these communities were not only had, um, not only was Christianity uh, very present in Africa, but um, but also was integral in, in terms of influencing all of Christianity. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, just like, um, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, Egypt, I mean, to start chronologically, I mean, Egypt, we mentioned how, um, you know, even the early, I mean, the earliest biblical fragments come out of Egypt. You know, the John Rylands papyrus is uh, the, from the uh, mid second century, and that's the earliest extant biblical fragment it found anywhere. And, uh, and it was found in Egypt. And, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of early Christianity really flourished in Egypt. Another great example is monasticism. And so monasticism is something that developed in Egypt. And, you know, um, you know Anthony the Great, who was, um, you know, again, a lot of people, might, some people might have heard of him because, again, Athanasius, who was the Pope of Egypt, wrote his biography in Greek. Um, and uh, so some people may have heard of Anthony, but again, his, again, his African identity is sometimes downplayed. But even in his biography, when Athanasius wrote, who was the Bishop of Egypt, uh, wrote his biography, uh, Athanasius was very keen to point out that Anthony was Egyptian. Uh, that, I mean, the text says that he was Egyptian in his race. And it points out the fact that Anthony, according to Athanasius, was not able to speak Greek, but that he spoke uh, Egyptian. Now, Egyptians, uh, Christians were, they spoke Greek and Latin. I mean, excuse me, Greek and Coptic. There was a mix. And so we don't, uh, I mean, this gets into like a more specialized conversation and scholarship, but there, there's a way that in Coptic scholarship, uh, the Coptic church has been 
seen as something that is kind of anti-Greek and pro-Coptic, that there's this, um, you know, kind of uh, move away from speaking Greek and only wanting to speak Coptic. And I, I have to be careful with that because that that dichotomy has been overstated in inaccurate ways in scholarship, especially in the early and mid 20th century. Um, it's clear that Coptic was the indigenous language. It, I mean, the word Coptic comes from the name, uh, the Greek name for Egypt. Aiguptos com goes in, comes from Aiguptos into Coptic, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the anglicized version of the Grecized or Hellenized version of the name for Egyptian. And so it was the Egyptian language. It's, it's, it's the same language in the same family of hieroglyphics, hieratic, demotic, and then Coptic is the final phase uh, where it rejects the hieroglyphic figures and adopts the Greek alphabet. Um, some people think specifically because it, that was when Egyptians became predominantly Christian and wanted to disassociate themselves from their, uh, you know, the, the previous religion of Egypt, you know, with Horus and Isis and uh, Ra and all that, and all that stuff. Um, but, uh, and so, yeah, the Christians, you know, were definitely Coptic speakers, um, but they didn't, uh, it, it's, a, it's kind of a both and. They didn't completely reject speaking Greek uh, and Greek culture, but they were critical of it at, at various points. And there was a distinction. And so one of those is Anthony, for example, is in his biography, it's constantly um, pointed out that he doesn't know how to speak Greek and that he only spoke Coptic. And so there is a, uh, there is a tendency in Coptic literature to kind of emphasize um, uh, somebody being able to speak Egyptian as kind of there being an Egyptian pride in it. I want to overemphasize it to say that, that people didn't know how to speak Greek because another name that we should know is Shenouda. And Shenouda is uh, the most uh, really important writer in all of uh, African Christianity, I would say, and certainly in Egyptian, uh, in the Coptic church. Shenouda was a monastic leader who lived in the late uh, fourth and early fifth century and who led a monastic community that still is an active monastic community today uh, called the White Monastery. Um, and it was called the White Monastery because of the, the, the color of the stones that it was built uh, out of. And it's in Upper Egypt or Southern Egypt in the modern, near the modern town of Sohag. And Shenouda um, was really one of the first uh, writers to write a great deal in, in the Coptic language and develop Coptic literature. So uh, reading his writings is, is, is kind of goes hand in hand with learning the Coptic language and learning about the Coptic church. And there's, uh, there's actually two publications that just came out last year that um, are really the first uh, that I know of, first major publications, uh, translations of his works into English. One of them is called The Canons of Our Fathers, which was translated by Bentley Layton from Yale University. And the other one is called, um, uh, I, I, think, I forget what the title is, but I know the subtitle is, um, uh, selected writings from the discourses of Shenouda, but that one was translated by David Brackey, uh, B-R-A-K-K-E, uh, from Ohio State University, and then also Andrew Chrislett. And um, and so those those two books actually, it's interesting because in Coptic literature, there's actually two main genres of literature that Shenouda wrote in, and and they're in, and they are unique to Cop the Coptic language and Coptic literature and culture, which is also a almost entirely Christian culture. So that's an important point that I think that we always have to remember is that um, not only were most of the, uh, not, well not most, all, <laughs> that's an important point to remember too, is that all of the early African kingdoms were, were Christian. Not only was Christianity present in these places, but they were predominantly Christian. So those are the, the big four. I mean, again, we focused on three because that's where we have the indigenous languages, but also, if we can't, if we count North Africa or uh, you know the the Roman province of Africa, which was the capital was Carthage, so we count Africa, Carthage, and Carthage, um, Egypt, Nubia, Ethiopia as the four kind of main African Christian kingdoms on the continent of what we now call Africa. It's really important to understand that all of these places were predominantly Christian, and so again, uh, because we have to deal with this concept that Christianity is the white man's religion, that it was imposed on Africa, you know, from Europeans or, well, we have to also even look at the reality that um, there wasn't even a concept of Europe at the time that Christianity was the dominant religion in all of the ancient African Christian kingdoms. And so that's an you know, important point to know, uh, to understand as well. And that, and that again, Christianity was hand in hand with, um, 
with Ethiopian identity, with Nubian identity, with Egyptian identity. Uh, and so these, uh, so when we talk about Coptic and uh, or Ethiopian or literature or language, we're also at the same time talking about Christian literature. It's, it's sort of like uh, as African Americans, I mean, you know, our musical tradition of gospel, which is really kind of the foundation of any genre of American music, um, is inherently Christian. You can't you can't talk about uh, African American musical culture apart from Christianity. They go hand in hand, and it's the same thing with uh, even the very languages themselves of, um, of of early African Christianity. But but anyway, the uh, the two the two genres I was going to mention are in Coptic are the canons and the discourses. Those are the two genres that Shenouda writes in. And Bracky and Chrislip's uh, edition looks at his discourses, and Layton's uh, translation looks at his canons. And the, the main difference is that the canons tended to be focused more on the internal life of the monastery and the monks who were committed and lived in the monastery, whereas the discourses would often be focused more outward. It would include the monks, but it would also be, you would, Shenouda would come and he would preach a, a sermon and he would invite uh, the community, the broader community, because these these monasteries in Egypt that were all over Egypt, um, they were a really uh, important part of the community and society, and uh, and contributed to the economy and uh, you know kind of local local government and and society in many different ways. And this was a this was a, um, a, a an expression of Christianity that was birthed in Egypt. That later uh, folks like John Cashin and and others would later extrapolate and take into places like Europe. So the Irish and the Celtic and, uh, you know, uh, early, um, you know, German and French uh, monks were imitating the styles of monasticism that developed by Egyptians like Anthony and like Shenouda and like Pacomius. Pacomius, even before Shenouda, was the first to develop the uh, principal style of communal monasticism. So you had kind of the um, solitary monasticism that developed with Anthony, but then you had the um, communal monasticism with people like Pacomius and Shenouda, and these all developed in in Africa. So that, I mean, that's just a, a few examples. We could keep going, but uh, but those are just some of the um, you know the primary kind of names and, and figures that stand out. Um, can you name any um, female uh, early African church mothers, I should say, that were uh, pivotal in the development of Christianity? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the the the, the popular text, um, in, in, you know, that really kind of also reveals a lot of. I mean, I talked about Anthony and, and Pacomius and Shenouda, but a lot of the, um, you know, a lot a, a lot of the information that we can get in terms of you know early Egyptian monasticism, uh, you know, really really comes from. Um, the sayings of the Desert Fathers or the Apothegmata Patrum. And in that, in that text, we get lots of sayings and lots of, um, you know, uh, stories that, that just kind of explain a little bit about the lifestyle and the, the politeia, as they call it, or the way of life of Egyptian monastic figures in, in the Wadi Natrun or the, the, you know, kind of the, um, the area of Skatis, which even today, again, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of these are still uh, monastic communities. And so, um, but uh, also I mentioned that because also the, um, a lot of the figures that are mentioned in the Desert Fathers are also Desert Mothers. And so really it should be called the day, the sayings of the Desert Fathers and Mothers. And that's really one of the best, um, you know, really one of the best places to, I mean, it's the unfortunate reality that, that um, most of, most of Christian history, especially in the early periods, are written written by males. Even when it's about a woman, it's written by a male, and it's not really until um, I think uh, I think until Julian of Norwich that we you know finally have an a female Christian author writing you know from her own voice, and that uh, before that is predominantly written about about you know by males. Um, and so even you know even but um, but you know one example. Uh, I mean, but again, the Desert Fathers, uh, the, the sayings of the Desert Fathers also has a lot of sayings of Desert Mothers, like um, uh, Syncletica of Alexandria and, uh, you know, uh, Melania the Younger and other um, Desert Mothers that are mentioned that that, that uh, appear throughout that text. Another example is the, even before that, actually like several, a couple, uh, many years before the uh, sayings of the Desert Fathers and Mothers is also the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicity. And uh, that's, you know, again, going back to North Africa, Perpetua and Felicity were two North African Christian women who were martyred for their faith. And 
again, even though um, that text is written by a male, you even see ways in which um, females are being being brought to the fore as uh, as as ideal Christian virtuous women. Uh, even in that story, where um, you know the the their father is trying to uh, dissuade Perpetua from uh, facing martyrdom, and then she refuses his. You know, she asks him. She asks. He asks her to recant her face so she won't be killed and she refuses and she faces her death, you know, bravely, um, as well, you know, as well as Felicity and the, uh, and, and even that with kind of showing a woman resisting the will of her father in order to follow her heavenly father is, is a, you know, kind of, um, a way of, of, or in early Christianity of really putting forth, uh, putting women uh, more at the fore and attempting in at least a, in a in a in a certain way to bring female voices out to the front. So those would be you know like the Desert Mothers, um, and then also uh, the um, uh, Perpetuum Felicity. Although and then another example would not uh, not not so much this. Uh, there's no uh, textual evidence, but also even in um, even in Ethiopian Christianity, the queens of Ethiopian. There's you know there are several queens in Ethiopian church history that play a, a huge role. The first one is what the Ethiopian church holds as its original connection to Solomon and to its, uh, to Ju its Judaic and Semitic connection, uh, according to the tradition, is that the queen of, of Sheba mentioned in uh, 1 Kings chapter 10 was the queen of Ethiopia. Now there's a lot of discussion about, you know, where do we locate Sheba? And there's even like a couple of different Shebas mentioned even in Genesis and then throughout the Bible. And, uh, you know, is this to be associated with the Sabaeans of Southern Arabia or uh, with the Ethiopians? And then, but then that gets into another question about uh, are Sabaeans and Ethiopians even related? Because uh, I mean, there's a linguistic connection there. And so uh, is it the same? Because Ethiop um, Ethiopian and Arabian political borders were constantly shifting across the Red Sea. And there were several points in Ethiopian history where Ethiopians actually ruled the Red Sea. Um, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, the Ara Southern Arabian Peninsula, modern day Yemen and uh, Southern Saudi Arabia. And so um, it gets into all these questions. But the point is that we can't fully know if, if the Queen of Sheba of, of First Kings First of all, if she was a queen of Ethiopia, what we now know is Ethiopia, or then would have been um, Aksum. Mm. And we also don't know if um, they had a son who became the first monotheistic king of Ethiopia. But the point is that whether or not it happened, it's important that for Ethiopian Christian identity, that queens play a very significant pivotal role in the development of Christianity. At that point, it would have been monotheism or Judaism in particular. But then also another very important queen what would, would be the queen uh, who was the mother of King Azana. And King Azana was thought to be the king who brought Christianity into or really formalized the church. As you know, in Ethiopian church tradition, they had been monotheistic or following the God of Israel, God of Yahweh, uh, since the time of Solomon. And then the Ethiopian eunuch in, in, in Acts 8, again, that brings up a whole question of, well, was he Ethiopian or was he actually Nubian? Because Ethiopian was just kind of a way in Greek to just say black people uh, without <laughs> actually discriminating what kind of black person or, you know, and so, uh, so, you know, Edwin Yamauchi in his book, Africa in the Bible, argues that actually the eunuch mentioned in Acts 8 would have been from, uh, from, from Kush, or which would later be known as Nubia, and um, just south of Egypt. But, um, but again, uh, you know, regardless of whether that happened, we know that Christianity is is most certainly in Ethiopia no later than three the early three hundreds. And at that time, the uh, there was a a Syrian a Syrian uh, um, missionary who lived and was actually a he grew up as a slave in Ethiopia and then became a missionary who evangelized many people. And then uh, he uh, the queen of Ethiopia at that time, who was the mother of Azana when he was a boy, asked for Mentius to mentor him and, and disciple him in the word. And then when Azana grew up, he established Christianity. And there's a, um, there's a famous Azana stone that, uh, where he's ascribing his victories to, to God. And uh, it's during his time period that, it, you know, uh, that we have hard concrete evidence that no later than his time period was did Christianity become the official state religion of Aksum or Ethiopia. And uh, but again, her, his mother, the queen, played a very pivotal role in that. So even the way that the way that queens played this pivotal role um, in Ethiopian Christianity, I think, is you, you could say maybe another example of how um, indirectly women are functioning uh, in important ways. That's the, that's good. That's I think that's helpful because 
when we talk about is Christianity the white man's religion, and we, then we point to early African church fathers, then then black women can say, well, where was I in history? And so I think it's important to show mm -hmm. that there were black men and women in Africa that mm -hmm. uh, were devout Christians and believers way before the transatlantic slave trade. And uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't, they weren't, um, they weren't converted through white Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, indigenous uh, to their community. So uh, for those who are really wrestling through this and deal with people on, with black cults on a day-to-day -day basis in the urban community or just in maybe in their families, how do you think we should help them navigate? What resources would you point them to? I know we got about 15 minutes before you need to head out. So I wanted to make sure we get those resources in and also kind of how would you uh, encourage them to engage with these people who are a part, have a, adopted or have entered into black cults like the Moors, Kemet, mm -hmm. Hebrew Israelites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, question. I mean, um, you know, I think that uh, um, at least from my discipline, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to speak as much to other disciplines, but at least from the discipline of church history um, and uh, and the, you know, to point people to resources to come at it from that pr particular perspective, uh, which I think is actually one of the strongest uh, perspectives to bring into uh, engaging other African Americans and other uh, people of African descent that are of other faiths that you know are particularly kind of antagonistic to Christianity. Uh, I think it's I think it's important to start with uh, a lot of times with history because that's usually where they're coming from, whether consciously or subconsciously. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about uh, our community and the and and the just the cultural and spiritual dynamic of people who leave the faith. I mean, first of all, I think that's an important point to start off with is the fact that many African Americans who are part of these other groups, they they all very very often they started out as Christians. Uh, I think that's an important point to uh, whether they they individually were a Christian and converted from Christianity into Islam or five percenters or. Hebrew Israelites or whatever else, um, either they they themselves converted or they their parents were converted. Uh, but you you would be hard pressed, I would argue, to find an African American who is a Muslim and whose great grandparents were Muslims. You would be hard pressed to find that, um, or a you know a, like a five percent or Hebrew or any other. You know, if you go back in in the uh, the majority of African American spiritual family lives. You're gonna find Christianity now. I mean, how how much of that is actually cultural, or how much of it is, um, you know, actually legitimate faith is a different question. But the point is, is that Christianity still is and always has been the dominant faith of African American people. Uh, and so people, uh, so African Americans who are going into these other religions again, they're doing it from from a point of they're not doing it from a blank slate. They're not like uh, have no religious background whatsoever, and they're oh I. You know, some Hebrew Israelite came up to me, and uh, you know, now I've you know I've joined this religion, and my me and my family background had no, no, they're 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 coming from a Christian platform, and oftentimes the leaders of these groups uh, are also coming from a Christian platform, and it's also interesting to see the way in which African American Christian spirituality and even vernacular still pervades a lot of these different movements, and so again, we in many ways these are offshoots of and reactions against Christianity. And so then that begs the question of why, uh, why is it that um, that so many black people are leaving Christianity? I mean, it's not, you know, it's still, I mean, again, Christianity is still the dominant faith, but more and more people are leaving and why. And again, when you talk to these groups, it's interesting the way in which um, a lot of the, the conversation and a lot of the rhetoric is often not theological, but it's racial. If you, if you really talk to a Hebrew Israelite and talk to a five percenter or talk to someone who's part of the nation of Islam, they, they will talk about uh, racial issues more than actually engaging theological issues. Um, and, and, and even when you do engage theological issues, it's the role of black people as the 144,000 or the role of black people as, as the presence of God or, or as the nation of Israel. And, and so, um, so uh, my, two, my two propositions or arguments is that, number one, they're coming from Christianity. Uh, and so there's, some, there's something wrong or there's something 
uh, to how Christianity is being presented to them that's causing them to leave. That we have to take responsibility for. Number two, a lot of their concerns are more social through their America and you know 400 years of transatlantic slave trade and oppression and Jim Crow and even now the way that we're still being marginalized and and targeted by uh, you know even the way a lot of policing and the justice system works and the way it targets us and a lot of valid critiques that a lot of times uh, we as Christians even as Black Christians have have really not been as prophetic in addressing as we could be. Um, and, and then you couple that with depictions of white Jesuses and, um, you know, and just the, this idea that Christianity was this religion that's forced upon us, then you can understand why people are going into these movements. But that's why, again, it's so important to point them to history and to go beyond further back than 400 years. We have to go back a thousand years and we have to go back 1500 years. And yes, white uh, European nations um, entered into, invaded, stole Africans from their land and enslaved them and uh, well, actually dumped most of them in the Atlantic Ocean on the way over. But the ones that survived that horrendous uh, nightmare by, uh, by people who claim to be Christians. Um, and so we have to, I would suggest, we have to not uh, be argumentative in denying the atrocity that was committed and still is being committed to black people by white Christians who claim to be, uh, who claim to be Christians. And we have to even look at how so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ who claim to be uh, concerned with the poor and the oppressed and who claim to be Christians still you know, like, like almost, you know, it, by and large, threw in their lot with a with a candidate in this last couple months who is uh, extremely problematic when we think about a lot of these issues. And and so we have to we have to be prophetic about telling the truth and acknowledging the pain and suffering and oppression and systematic injustice that we have and are facing. Because I think that. Um, you know, that will open up the door for more conversation when we're engaging people and they know that we're not going to automatically be defensive or dismissive. Because again, I think that's what's driving a lot of them to uh, these religions is that uh, we are presenting the gospel in a very weak fashion. And we're, we're not drawing upon the resources of our own faith that have, uh, the Bible is full of prophetic uh, engagement. I mean, we, we cannot read the book of Isaiah or the book of Micah or uh, we can't even read the Gospels without seeing a very strong prophetic engagement with systemic injustice. But we have oftentimes pacified the Gospel, and we've pacified Jesus to be one that isn't, he's a Jesus only of forgiveness and, and grace, but, he, but we are denying the truth-telling and prophetic aspects of Jesus and of the Gospel. And, and so I think that that's the place that we start is affirming the reality of racism and injustice, um, and that, and and then and then also pointing them to the fact that the scriptures themselves speak to these issues and encourage us to prophetically engage these issues. And then I think, um, and then I think, as that opens up avenues for conversation, then we can be, begin to uh, point them in the direction of the fullness of history and say yes. White people did this to us. They are a lot of them claim to be Christians. But guess what? Even before the transatlantic slave trade ever started. And you know what? Let's go back even before that. Let's go back before before white people were even Christians. When at at a time when the 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 Germanic uh, Saxons and you know uh, other kind and Norwegians and Scandinavians and you know Northern European and Western Europeans were still worshiping Odin and Thor. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, they had never even heard of Jesus at that time, even in the fifth and fourth and third and second centuries, the gospel was already in Africa. Not only that, and, it, and not only that, not only before European war, Islam even existed. So someone says, well, Islam is the religion of the black man. Well, actually, uh, before Islam even existed, Christianity was in Africa. And when Muslims came into Africa, Christianity came into Africa peacefully. And it came in and it was welcomed. 
and uh, you know, uh, Middle Eastern Jewish apostles brought the gospel in Africa and of their own accord, and they constructed churches and monasteries and wrote theology in African languages, and they embraced it autonomously. When Islam comes in, hundreds of years after the fact, after Christ, after Christianity already had already taken firm root and had become synonymous with Ethiopian identity, with Nubian identity, with Egyptian identity. Hundreds of years after that, Islam comes along from the middle, middle uh, from the Arabian Peninsula and comes into Africa with force and forces itself upon Africans who were Christian. The Africans that the Muslims dominated were Christians. They eradicate Carthaginian or North African Christianity. They take over Egypt and uh, and and become the dominant after you know a, a slow process hey, whatever sir and then but they them off so you have a, a an arab in the separate egypt and then trying nubians even the arab historians are honest enough to admit that specifically the nubians were too skilled with the bow and arrow that they were called pupil smiter like i like they were so good they could shoot people in the eye from long long distances that they these were christians this was a Christian nation that resisted a black that resisted Arab uh, incursion, Islamic incursion, and they were unique in being the only nation to do that. Everywhere in the seventh century, everywhere that the early followers of Muhammad went to conquer, they conquered the Persian Empire, they conquered Syria, Jerusalem, Palestine, uh, Egypt, Carthage, North Africa. Nubia was the only, this black Christian kingdom was the only kingdom that successfully fought off um, the Muslims. And the Ethiopians, they never even tried to conquer the Ethiopians. That's the other thing. Ethiopians had, it, it, they're even mentioned in the Quran as being people who aided Muhammad and some of his followers in the early days when Muslims were being persecuted in, in Medina. And so um, Ethiopians always had a kind of a favorable perspective for Muslims. But again, we have to take people back to, to history and show them that Christianity was thriving in these places. Then we have to introduce them to, like again, like that I mentioned, you know, the writings of the Desert Fathers, the writings of, um, you know, you got books by uh, Thomas Oden. You also have uh, Aziz Atiyah, who is a Coptic scholar who wrote an introductory uh, history to history of Eastern Christianity, which gives kind of an overview. Um, you know, you have uh, Philip Jenkins' book, The Lost History of Christianity. And um, uh, you have Salim Faraji's book, uh, the, uh, um, the Roots of Nubian Christianity. You have Ephraim Isaac's book on the Ethiopian Orthodox Tiwahiro Church. And to, to you know, really bring, bring people to some of these books that, you know, are written from African Christians themselves to really f give them a fuller picture of, 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 um, of African history, which is in the early years uniquely. Hello? Can you hear me, Vince? Mm hmm yeah. Okay, it kind of went out at the end on your on your end, but I think we got all the, I think the resources, hopefully, I think I was able to hear all of them. So hopefully when the playback, it won't be messed up. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So much for your time. And you guys who are watching, you can go back and look at the blogs uh, that uh, Dr. Bantu has written for the Jew3 Project and the past episode. Uh, this is part two the video version and we're going to be doing some more work with him in the future. So stay on the lookout. How can people get in contact with you, uh, Dr. Bantu? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people can feel free to uh, send me an email uh, at uh, Vince.Bantu at uh, covenantseminary.edu uh, or you can hit me on Facebook. I'm on there, Vince Bantu. And so yeah, I would love to continue to chop it up with people. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure.